All right. Um, I think it makes sense to begin now as more people are logging on. Um, so hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I'll give you a quick introduction. Um, my name is Elizabeth, and I'm an OCEANS intern with Environment America Research and Policy Center. Um, our goal is to protect our air, water, and open spaces, and we investigate problems, craft solutions, educate the public and decision makers, and help the public make their voices heard in local, state, and national debates over the quality of our environment and our lives. Um, thanks so much for joining us for a webinar on the next generation of ocean conservation. This is the seventh part in our Our Amazing Oceans webinar series. We'll begin tonight's program um, with a series of underwater uh, photographs and videos taken by our art panelist, Bryn Rarden, um, who is a dive master, underwater videographer, a recent college graduate, and a small business owner. Um, after that, um, we'll have Chris Mayer, um, who just graduated from the University of Rhode Island with a degree in marine biology, um, discuss his undergraduate research on changing underwater food web dynamics off the coast of New England. Um, finally, we will have Sithara Menon, uh, UCLA student and CalPERG State Board Vice Chair, um, share a few stories about her experiences getting UCLA to go plastic free um, and the power of student organizations to affect policy change for our oceans. Um, and at the end, you will have the chance to ask any of these speakers any questions that you might have, and you can do that using the chat box, and we will answer them in the order received. But before we dive into the panel portion of the evening, I would love to share with you all a quick story that helped inspire me to plan this webinar this evening. So every summer in July from the ages of 11 to 15, I went to overnight camp um, right on the southeast coast of Rhode Island, right on Narragansett Bay. Um, as a kid, I was really eager to get away for the summer and just spend time in nature. We lived in cabins and it was like the best thing, one of my um, favorite memories. And one activity I signed up for every single summer was marine biology. Um, I remember learning about all the local sea creatures like moon jellies, quahogs, and even squids that flourish in those waters and when we were lucky we got to take the boat out onto Point Judith and we got to see all of those really cool creatures up close and personal and just learn all about them um, and I remember vividly just being like 12 years old with my life vest strapped on tight feeling the sun on my back and the wind through my hair as we were out on the boat and how excited I was about just learning about my local environment and local oceans um, and my curiosity and my appreciation for all things ocean was really born out of those years I spent at camp um, and looking back the planet and our oceans have definitely changed a lot since I was a kid um, exploring them and a lot of the times they have changed for the worse and the reality is is that the health of our oceans going forward is really dependent on what um, this next generation does of what my generation does to protect the oceans. So that's why I'm so hopeful to see so many of you here tonight um, to hear from three ocean activists share um, what they're doing in their um, youth years to help protect our oceans. And by everyone tuning in tonight, you're really helping build momentum for the movement to keep our oceans healthy and keep sea creatures safe for the future. So with that said, I would love to turn it over to our first panelist, Bryn, who is the art panelist. Hi everyone. Um, you can hit the first slide. Um, my name is Bryn Raritan. I am originally from Concord, New Hampshire. Um, I am a dive master and an underwater videographer you can see me here playing um, go fish with a lemon shark. Um, I went to Connecticut College. I graduated in 2017 with a degree in psychology and art. Um, 
and it was my semester abroad in New Zealand that really kind of pushed me over the edge and I knew that I really wanted to do something um, with water and I got certified diving and after I graduated I ended up working for a liveaboard um, scuba diving company first in Turks and Caicos and then in the Bahamas and that's where my love for the ocean really grew um, and so since leaving that I really have just seen so much devast not just amazing encounters but also devastation that I know that conservation is really um, what I want to do. Um, two things, if you're interested in learning more about me or seeing more of the videos, photos, work that I've done, please feel free to check out my website at brynraritan.com, pretty easy to remember. Um, and if you have any questions or just wanna chat or really interested in anything that I have to say, please feel free to email me, I'm always um, looking to connect with like-minded people. Slide. Um, so I'll be talking with you a little bit today about the artistic side of um, protecting our oceans. Visual mediums um, are a really great way for us to communicate with our communities and help um, raise awareness. For me, art has always been a really big part of how I express myself. And really having the privilege to capture these um, still moments with these animals, having gotten to, you know, be this close with them has really been amazing for me, but it's even more amazing to share it with others, to give people information about these um, animals and really capture their attention. Um, slide. Um, but what I really focus on is um, video. I love taking videos. I've gotten, um, I really got to work on my skills while I worked for the um, Liveaboard Diving Company. And I've had the privilege to dive with some really incredible animals, including um, humpback whales, spotted dolphins, tiger sharks, hammerhead sharks. Um, and these are really privileged encounters, really privileged experiences that most people never will get to have. And I really think it's up to me to, you know, bring people into these moments with me, show them what's under the waves, because if you can't find something to help people connect to the ocean, it's kind of out of sight, out of mind. So being able to really help them have those really exciting experiences, even if it's through a screen, can really be that changing point to make someone care about something that you care about. So you can actually go to the next slide. Um, but I do a lot of different types of art. Um, in college, I was really into drawing and um, painting. And so for me, different mediums of art really reach, you know, different types of people. And I think that's really important to kind of think about is what what can reach different groups. Um, maybe it's an image, maybe, maybe the image really does speak a thousand words, maybe it's the video, maybe it's the drawing or the you know, big art show. Um, but whatever it is, I think that there's a lot to be said for how we can communicate with people through more visual means versus just with words. Slide. Um, so as, um, Elizabeth mentioned, I have started a small business. I think it, another great way that you can engage people is through fashion. Um, for me, what I love most right now is uh, rash guards and bathing suits, things that I can dive in because scuba diving is really important to me. And I recognize that a lot of the things that people were wearing in the water didn't necessarily show the encounters they were having with animals. And I think that a great way you can also engage people is through what they buy, having conversations about what it's made with, whether it's, you know, reused material or whether it's, you know, who's, who's working to make it. Um, and also having ways for people to donate through what they're purchasing. So maybe having 10% of the proceeds going to something that um, helps conserve these animals and protect them. Um, so I think for me, these are ways that I can have a part in the world of conservation. I'm not a biologist. I've never 
been great at science, no matter how much I wanted to be. Um, but for me, being artistic was how I could communicate how important these animals are to me to the world. So my hope is that, you know, even if they reach one person, that's enough to, to get to show people these things and have it mean something to them that that in itself matters to me. Um, so I'm also going to talk a little bit about two specific experiences I had scuba diving that really kind of shaped my, my want to, you know, turn out of ecotourism into conservation. Um, both of these I'm going to talk over while I show you the videos. Um, so bear with me. I know that they're a little bit um, slow, but hopefully they will will do them justice. They're also on my um, website if you want to watch them again. Um, but last year in Bimini in the Bahamas, I had the privilege of getting to dive with these Atlantic spotted dolphins who were incredibly playful. Um, just to have an animal look at you and to see you, like to know that you're both having eye contact and holding eye contact is really incredible. And someone ended up bringing in um, like a red handkerchief or red cloth and we played capture the flag with these dolphins. And to play a game that you normally play with other humans, but to do it with an animal, it just makes, at least for me, it made me realize how similar we all are and just to realize their intelligence, um, to see them trying to keep things away from us, but still wanting to engage with us. That was something that really helped me see how important they are and how much they need our help. Um, Cause no matter how smart they are, they can't tell us they need help. So it's us, up to us to really stand up for them. Slide, you can hit the next one. Um, so two things that I really try to remember when I'm working is that perception is everything. We live in a world of fake news and it's really hard in this, in the realm and the world of social media to really figure out what the truth is. Um, as you saw in one of my earlier videos, I did a lot of diving at Tiger Beach with a lot of different types of sharks. And for me, sharks have become one of the most important um, animals because they are so misunderstood. So for me, perception is everything because the way we perceive sharks specifically is so in my mind wrong. Um, they're so important for our ecosystem and our oceans and their health that I think that if I can help people change that perception that I am really potentially helping to change the world. <clears throat> Slide. The other thing that I think is really important to remember is that knowledge is power. We as a group of environmentalists are really privileged in what we know and how we've been educated, but a lot of people don't know what we know. So it's up to us to try to educate. Um, and when we are, you know, educate ourselves, but then pass that knowledge on whatever that form is. For me, it's through art, through visual ways, but for you, it might be something different, but we all can play a role in trying to bring more real true facts and knowledge into the conversation. Um, so my last story is actually about sharks. And um, this is actually a clip of a longer video that I have on my website called Turning Fear into Fascination. Um, but Elizabeth, if you wanna hit the next slide. Um, I had an another experience about a year ago where I was doing a safety stop and I saw a lemon shark swim towards the surface because there was this big plastic bag on the surface. And the way sharks tend to tell if they like something is they bite down on it and the shark bit down on it and then it couldn't get it out of its teeth. I had never thought about the fact that the bag would puncture its teeth and it was just moving back and forth trying to get this bag off of its head or and out of its teeth and in that moment I had no idea what I was going to do. How would I help a shark? And eventually it got rid of the bag but that was really eye-opening to me in the world of plastic pollution. Um, and so this is a little bit fast, I apologize for that. But to me, if I, even for myself, seeing something for myself in the ocean and the way that plastic affects animals, I hadn't recognized that something as small or, and as meaningless to us as the plastic bag, which we just carry with our hands, 
could not just potentially be consumed, but could get stuck in an animal's teeth. So for me, be using video and photos and art is a way, you know, to express to the outside world the effect we have, especially as I've mentioned, um, it's what I've been able to do is comes from such a privileged point of view. So um, that's, those are my two stories and I have <laughs> plenty of other stories, but I hope that they meant something to you and I really appreciate Environment America and Elizabeth for having me on this panel. Awesome, thank you so much for sharing that, Bryn. I still can't get over the video of you playing cards with shark. That's just the <laughs> coolest thing ever and your story is very inspiring. So thanks for kicking off the evening. Um, and next we will have Chris talk a little bit about his research and give us the science perspective. All right, uh, thank you, Elizabeth. Again, my name is Chris Mayer, and today I'm gonna be talking about climate change, our oceans, and the future of conservation. So if you wanna go to the next slide. I'll give you a little bit of background about me. Um, I just graduated this May from the University of Rhode Island with a Bachelor of Science in Marine Biology. And right now I'm about to begin my master's in marine science at Nova Southeastern University. And I'm expecting to graduate in May of 2022. During my time at URI, I was an undergraduate research assistant, a volunteer. Uh, I worked on a charter boat as a mate and I played hockey all throughout college. Just a little fun fact. Um, and today I really want to talk about, give, give you a little general, very general overview of climate change, my research, and how it all links together. So I want to start off by saying that Earth is a dynamic entity, which means that it is always changing. For example, the continents that we live on, they're on tectonic plates. And each year, um, tectonic plates move about three to five centimeters which doesn't seem like a lot, but over millions and millions of years, that ends up becoming very substantial. Our atmosphere gives us ideal conditions to support life. And on the next slide, I'm going to explain a little bit about um, how our atmosphere works and the uh, greenhouse effect. But something, before we go there, something that's important to understand is the difference between weather and climate. Weather is the daily interactions that we see between our atmosphere, the oceans, and the air. And climate is sort of the average long-term um, weather patterns that we're able to see. And there's data that dates back hundreds of thousands of years from ice cores and sediment samples that sort of give us a general idea of how, how our planet has changed over million year scales or 500,000 year scales. So if you wanna to go to the next slide. Um, greenhouse gases are, Greenhouse gases are things that have become kind of stigmatized for good reason, but they are also very important for our atmosphere. For example, water vapor, carbon dioxide, and methane are examples of some greenhouse gases that allow our Earth to support life. Um, the greenhouse effect is essentially when ultraviolet solar radiation comes into the Earth and some infrared terrestrial radiation goes out back into space, but the um, the amount of terrestrial radiation that stays in our atmosphere is essentially what heats our planet. And carbon dioxide and methane are natural waste products. We breathe in oxygen, we breathe out carbon dioxide. But because of a rising human population and um, further rising industrialization, we are pumping unprecedented amounts of carbon dioxide and methane and other waste products into the atmosphere, which causes less infrared radiation to be able to escape into the atmosphere, which brings on global warming and climate change. Also more urbanization uh, leads to more deforestation and more waste that gets put into our atmosphere and our oceans. So if you wanna to go to the next slide. This is a very general diagram of what I just talked about, the um, greenhouse effect. So you can see the incoming solar radiation that comes from the sun, and then a certain amount of it goes back into space, and some of it stays in our atmosphere. It gets trapped by greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide. And now I'll talk a little bit about my research and how it all kind of links together. If you want to go to the next slide. 
So for about a year and a half, when I was at URI, I was involved in Dr. Kelton McMahon's Ocean Ecogeochemistry Laboratory at the URI Graduate School of Oceanography. And I was involved in a project that compared the food web dynamics of Atlantic cod and black sea bass. Well, why did we do that? Because in, it, in, in Southern New England, Atlantic cod is a very historically abundant species and black sea bass was never really that abundant in the area until recent decades when researchers, fishermen, and other scientists notice a drastic decline in the Atlantic cod population and a spike in the um, abundance of black sea bass. So what I did was I used different scientific techniques. Uh, we used gut content analysis, bulk isotope analysis, and compound specific isotope analysis of amino acids to determine pretty much where in the food web both of these species fit in southern New England and whether or not they are competing for the same resources. And what we found was in the summer months, both species were eating the same types of food, but not as much in the winter. And what we were able to determine was that warming ocean waters in southern New England have caused uh, black sea bass to move north and live in the and live in waters that they were previously unable to live in because it was too cold. So go to the next slide. I was also involved with Dr. Bradley Weatherby's um, URI Shark Undergraduate Research and Education Program, where and uh, that's an internship held every summer where the interns um, analyze. Um, migratory patterns of different shark species in southern New England and they're also heavily involved in marine education and outreach program. For example, each summer they hold a shark camp that takes kids generally in lower socioeconomic areas of Rhode Island out on boats and they go fishing and they get to experience a whole bunch of different um, aspects of what it means to be a marine scientist. And last summer, I was a mate on um, Snap and Charters, where we did a lot of sport fishing, catch and release shark fishing, and shark cage diving. But what was really interesting to me about working on this charter boat was that I got to see firsthand just how many black sea bass were in southern New England. I mean, we'd catch 40 to 50 every single day. And I'd say over the entire summer, we caught maybe four or five Atlantic cod. So to me, that was a real eye-opener that this really is happening, that there is a change in the climate, a change in the oceans, and a change in the whole food web of southern New England and the rest of the world. Next slide. So what to take away from these stories is that science is how we determine questions that we have in our lives through observation, experimentation, and analysis. And science can be something as complex as my research, or it can be like learning how to ride a bike. I'm sure the first time that everybody got on a bicycle probably didn't go too well, but through trial and error, you get better at it. And that leads me to, the next, to my next point that anybody can be a scientist and you don't necessarily need a formal background. And what I've found is that the word science is often associated with extreme intelligence. And sure, if you want to get a little more in depth, yeah, you got to, you, you know, there's a lot to learn, but you don't necessarily need a college degree or a master's degree or anything to be a scientist. Um, humans are causing climate change at unprecedented rates, again, through increasing human population and industrialization, and everybody has a part to play in environmental conservation. Go to the next slide. And through my education, what I've taken away is just a greater, more in-depth understanding of environmental processes and sort of how our Earth supports life and how humans have changed our planet. And it's also given me a greater consciousness of my own personal carbon footprint. And it's given me a lot of insight into what I can do to help, how to teach others, and how to question what I know, and how to teach myself things. So next slide. There's still a lot to learn and we are still, you know, it's, it's up to us and our generation to continue to carry the torch and make the world a better place by learning and, um, you know, developing science and research that is ultimately going to be able to be put into policy. So 
doing your part can be as simple as recycling your water bottle and getting a reusable one. But ultimately what needs to happen is people need to sign petitions. People need to get involved. People need to ultimately convince those who make laws to make them a little bit, you know, better for our world in the end. And so what everybody should do, like Bryn said, is always seek and demand the truth. Just constantly search out facts, do your own research, and trust that the people who do this science are doing it for the best interest of the world. Next slide. And so I'd like to thank Dr. Kelton McMahon, Dr. Bradley Weatherby, URI and Nova Southeastern and Elizabeth for having me on this panel. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you for that amazing presentation, Chris. Um, your research is very cool to me and your takeaways were also very inspiring. So thank you for bringing the science perspective to um, tonight's panel. And now I would love to turn it over to our policy panelist, Sathara, to take it away. Hi everyone, um, my name's Safara. I'm so happy to be here today. Chris really set that up perfectly for me. It's almost like we uh, coordinated because I'm going to tell you guys about a uh, policy to help protect our oceans and how all of you can get involved. Um, but just to start off, um, I figured I would just introduce myself a little bit. So if you want to go to the next slide, please. So this is a picture of me. Um, if you didn't guess that. My name's Sathara. Um, I am a senior at UCLA studying biology, and I've been working with CalPERG students for the past three years, going on to my fourth. Um, CalPERG is a, a student organization on campus. We are a student-run and student-funded advocacy group working to make sure that young people's voices are being heard in places of power so that our generation can have a say in the future that we're going to be inheriting. Um, so CalPERG is just one state of the many student PERG states um, across the country. Um, and you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram. I dropped our handle right there if you guys want to see some more of what we're working on or follow along with what we're doing. And uh, I'm gonna give a quick plug to myself. You could also follow me at ssmenin2 on Twitter um, to hear more about what I'm working on in terms of advocacy and policy. Um, but yeah, you can go ahead and go to the next slide, please. So, this is a lot of crazy pictures, and you guys are probably wondering what all of this is. Um, but if you look closely, you'll notice that one of the things that you can see in common is that a lot of these have the word PERG on them, um, which stands for the Public Interest Research Group. Um, so the organization that I work with, the Student PERGs, is uh, a network of student chapters across the country working, as I mentioned, to um, basically fight for young people. Um, and so I wanted to tell you guys a little bit more about why I personally got involved with this. And it might not seem directly relation related to ocean conservation at first, but bear with me, it will all tie together at the end. Um, but yeah, I, uh, as a UCLA student, my freshman year, um, started studying biology and I took some really cool classes on introductory ecology and climate change. Um, and it was really fascinating to me because it really built upon and gave me a better understanding of something that I had been seeing my entire life. Um, because growing up in California, the impacts of climate change, pollution, and environmental degradation have been very visible and very obvious to me. Um, but as I went to college, I realized that there was so much incredibly interesting research and innovation being done um, to come up with all the solutions for this. So like Chris highlighted, there is so much being done to find the answers to why different species are dying out, 
why we're seeing fires across our state and all of these other answers. Um, and I realized that there, we needed to translate all of these answers from people's opinions and incredible research that's being done into policies and laws that we're actually seeing in the world around us. Um, and so my freshman year of college, there was a huge slew of fires across the state of California. It was pretty terrifying. A lot of people that I know lost their homes and lost their lives. And I realized that all of these issues that I was learning about were impacting my community and my loved ones right away. And I didn't want to wait to make a difference. So I got involved with CalPERG working on a campaign for renewable energy. And I got to see that the work that we do, um, amplifying the voice of young people and building grassroots support can make a big concrete difference on the issues that people of our generation care about and that we can shape the future that we want to inherit. Um, and that's why I decided to start a campaign at UCLA to help protect our oceans because this is an issue that I've always cared about and that I knew so many of my peers cared about. Um, so if you want to go to the next slide, please. I can tell you guys a little bit more about what that was like. Um, so I think I'm actually going to skip over the slide of this problem because I think that um, Bryn touched on some of the issues of plastic pollution that we're seeing, um, especially with that story of the shark biting the plastic bag. We just heard all about a lot of the science between uh, of climate change. So I'll go right to the solution. We know that the way to stop the problem of plastic pollution in our ocean is to stop making and using unnecessary single-use plastics, period. That's it. The way to end plastic pollution is to stop making plastics we don't need. Um, next slide. Um, that ends up getting a lot more complicated when you think about how we want to do that. Um, but. The student perks focuses on policies to remove single-use plastics because we believe that this is the way we can make the most concrete change and make this something that's possible for everyone to do in their own lives. Um, so we've been focused on passing zero waste policies, policies that stop the sale of um, different types of plastic like plastic bag bans. Um, at the state and local level, um, as well as um, getting different institutions to make these commitments, which is more specifically what I worked on. So if we could go to the next slide. So um, this is the campaign that I specifically worked on. Um, I worked to get UCLA to phase out single-use plastics on our campus. So as I mentioned, um, I knew from my time just, you know, being a student on campus, talking to people, that the majority of people um, on my campus really cared about protecting our ocean and having a livable planet and ending the unnecessary pollution that we're seeing. Um, so we decided to work to make this change right in our own community to get UCLA, our campus, to take this first step and provide an example of what a plastic-free society could look like. Um, so our main strategy to make this happen, because of course we couldn't just ask for it and have it change, was to show our um, campus uh, administrators, the people with the power to make these decisions that um, there was an overwhelming majority of support among the student body for addressing plastic pollution. And we wanted to show our campus that they could really become a leader by taking this step and pave the way for other campuses and institutions to follow along. And so the way we did this is we ran a huge educational drive. We talked to over 10,000 students on our campus. Um, we had 1,800 students sign petitions saying that they were in support. 
and we collaborated with different organizations on campus with our student government and UCLA's Office of Sustainability. And I would like to mention that um, they were some of the greatest partners on this, doing a lot of the research to see what kinds of policies could actually make this happen. Um, and so we, after we built up all of this support and ran this huge educational push, we were able to go to the administration and show them that this was something that the student body really cared about and make all of those students' voices heard. Additionally, since CalPERG is a student-funded group, we actually signed up thousands of students as dues-paying members, showing that students cared so much about making their voices heard on these issues and fighting plastic pollution to protect our oceans that they were willing to put their money towards forming an advocacy organization to represent ourselves. Um, and so with all of that support, our administration decided that they would be able to make this change. And um, in July, UCLA started the first phase of phasing out single-use plastics on campus. Um, and if you go to the next slide, please. And now um, several other UCs are following along the way. So th those of you guys that are not familiar with California, UCLA is just um, one campus of the University of California system. Um, and in July, all of the UCs um, decided to update their zero waste policies to include even stronger commitments to get rid of the most harmful single use plastics. So in, in April, UC Berkeley signed one of the strongest commitments to move away from single use plastics. Um, and this is actually a picture of um, one of the CalPERG interns with the UC Berkeley Chancellor. Um, and then in July um, was when the entire system decided to update their policies. Um, and these are some of the um, most wide reaching policies to protect our ocean because they affect so many millions of students and workers um, because of just the size of the UC system. And I personally am really optimistic that, you know, despite um, the um, additional difficulties we've seen um, with COVID-19 and the way that that's changed, um, our takeout systems and, and other things having to do with plastic pollution. Um, I'm pretty optimistic that since UC Berkeley and the rest of the UCs decided to follow along with this commitment during the pandemic that we can continue to make really big changes and that, um, you know, our value on human health and protecting our communities does not have to be different from our value on protecting our oceans and our planet. Um, if you could go to the next slide. Um, and so that is the end of the story of what I did to work on this issue and how I wanted to do my own part to contribute. Um, but I do want to say that this is something that anyone can do. It is going to take all of us to create the future that we want to see, to create the sustainable future where all of the incredible animals that we saw in Bryn's photography and all of the important species that Chris has studied could all have the kind of environment they need to thrive and to give us as human beings a safer and more livable planet. Um, and so, I want to really encourage everyone to join an organizing group in your community because we know that those of us that want to see a cleaner planet and um, conserved oceans are the majority and that with people power, we can really make these changes. So I put the link to the student perks up on here because of course I have to plug my own organizations organizing group. If you're a student, um, or a recent graduate, I would really encourage you to check out getting involved with that. But no matter what side of this issue you're coming from, what your own personal reason for wanting to get involved is, the most important thing you can do is 
continue to have conversations about this and help change the narrative so that we can continue to educate our community and build momentum towards making really big change. Um, and I really encourage you all to advocate to your community leaders for policies that um, move away from plastics. Um, so whether that's your campus, your city or county or your state, um, advocating for policy solutions, um, I think is one of the best ways we can make change because it creates long lasting frameworks for a cleaner world and it makes these solutions accessible to everyone. Um, and I mean, I'll add as well, you know, you should advocate to your community leaders for any kind of issues that you care about that would protect our ocean, whether that's plastic or any other issue. Um, but yeah, that is all that I have to say about this. Um, yeah, so I will turn it back over to you, Elizabeth. Great, thank you so much for that amazing presentation, Sathara. I'm so happy we could end on that note, um, talking about how to affect real policy change and your story on uh, UCLA's campus is so inspiring. So thank you and thank you to um, Chris and Bryn as well for the amazing presentations again. Um, now we can move on to the next part of the evening. We have um, a little over 15 minutes left for the question and answer segment. And um, if you want to type questions into the chat box and um, I can direct them to the appropriate panelists. And yeah, let me um, scroll back to the beginning um, where we got some questions. Um, Okay, so uh, Gregory asked, do you think that individual action does any real good or are only large scale ocean cleaning projects worth it? Are any of them going to make an impact or is it just a nice idea? Um, I don't know if Sathara, you wanna start by answering this and then if um, Chris or Bryn has anything to add, feel free. Yeah, um, I would be happy to answer that. Um, I think that individual actions are important. However, I think that the, the real um, power is when we combine our individual actions um, and we can see real change. So I think that something does not have to be large scale or you know international or anything like that to make real change. I think when we take individual actions and use that to inspire others, we're able to start a movement and a network of making the world better. And so whether that's just taking individual actions in your own life to, um, I don't know, eat food that is more sustainable or anything else, or if that's signing one petition or writing a letter to your congressperson, I think that those individual actions do make a difference. Um, and if we're able to take those individual actions and amplify them by encouraging those around us to do the same thing or to do even more, we really can make such a huge impact in that way because every big change starts with one step and one conversation. Awesome. Yeah, I, I would add to that. Um, recently, I was in Hawaii doing an internship before COVID happened, which kind of ended up canceling that. But the beaches there are covered in microplastics. Um, it's really unfortunate to see. And I agree that it really comes down to policymaking, that we have to stop creating plastic um, because it doesn't break down. It just becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, they recently found that the organisms living at, in the deepest parts of the ocean are found with plastic in them. But we all want to be able to go to the beach at the same time. So, you know, if we can do our part to kind of try to make those beaches cleaner and find better ways to reuse that plastic, um, that is, I still think, a good thing to do. Um, I also really recommend for anyone who has not seen it, The Story of Plastic is an incredible documentary. I recently watched it a few months ago and it kind of blew my mind. Just the, the process 
process of creating plastic and the destruction that in itself has on humans. It, I never really thought about um, it in that way. And they really talk a lot about the need for policy change. So I agree that, you know, on an individual level, we can really make a difference in our own personal choices and the way that we consume. Um, but it really comes down to paying attention to what our policymaker is doing and really holding them accountable at the same time. Thank you guys for those answers. Um, and then Dolores asks for Chris, could it be a positive development that the black sea bass are taking over in the Rhode Island area? Mm. Um, well, both species are generalist predators, like I said. Uh, I don't know if it would necessarily be a positive or a negative development. It's just something that we've noticed that we've changed. And again, Atlantic cod is a very historically popular fishery in Southern New England, especially. Um, so I'm, I'll be honest, I'm not 100% sure. But I'm not sure. I, I don't think that it would necessarily be a positive or a negative. I just think that the influx of black sea bass is just going to cause a decline in the, in the uh, Atlantic cod populations. Um, and then a question for Bryn, have you ever had any dangerous encounters with sharks? Um, personally, I have not. I am sure that a lot of people have. I think it really comes down to, again, being educated, knowing how to be in the water around sharks. Um, one of the big things that we tell people is to always have your head on a swivel. Um, I, I've never had an instance of feeling threatened by a shark. Um, every time that I've been in the water with them, they've been really slow and curious. Um, again, you let them come to you if they're interested. Um, I have had a situation where um, the and the way that they do it in Tiger Beach, which again is controversial and I don't know if I agree with it, is they use bait boxes to bring the sharks near. So pretty much it's a hanging box that has fish in it. Um, and one of the sharks was able to get the box open and then the, there was fish in the water. And so in that situation, I didn't feel it was safe for people to be in the water. So I asked everyone to get out. But um, it's really about reading this situation and not Another thing is not putting a shark in a situation where they would feel the need to um, protect themselves. Because again, they don't have arms. They can't be like, please get out of my way. They have a mouth full of teeth. Um, and that tends to be the way that they try to protect themselves. I hope that answers your question. But I've never felt or been in a situation where I worried about my safety. Um, and we got another question about sharks. That I don't know if Bryn or Chris could answer, they just, uh, Cassidy and Billy asked, are sharks smart? Um, I, I think they're smart. I don't, they're obviously not the smartest of all the animals um, in the ocean, um, but they actually have seven senses and they've lived on this planet for 450 million years through five mass extinctions. So I'd say that they're pretty dang smart and knowing how to survive. Um, they know they're, situation. They know their community. They know how to best um, be in it. And I think they're, because sharks have been so feared, it's only more recently that we've seen a lot of shark research pop up. So I think there's still a lot to um, learn about them. But I, I definitely think that they're smart animals. They know, for the most part, they really know what they're doing. So I don't know if Chris wants to say anything to that. <laughs> Okay, um, and another question for Chris, how do you tag a shark? Well, there are a lot of different kinds, there's um, a couple different ways. Uh, one of them is a um, spaghetti tag, which is attached to the end of a long stick. And you essentially, you, you try to jab it into their dorsal fin, which don't worry, it doesn't hurt them because it's cartilage, it's almost like getting a nose or ear piercing, um, or you can attach um, satellite trackers. So when I was working on the charter boat, I probably tagged 15 to 20 um, blue and mako sharks with 
um, um, spaghetti tags, and I was also involved in applying one satellite tracker on a mako shark that's still being tracked to this day. And again, they're not harmful. Um, and that's essentially how you do it. Um, and then another question from Gregory, I think Sathara might be able to answer this. Um, he asked about how COVID had brought a quick end to the ban on plastic bags and now the new litter of uh, litter and waste are latex gloves and disposable masks. So how to balance the need for single use hygiene precautions and reducing waste? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll, I'll start with a disclaimer. I am obviously not a public health professional, um, so uh, I'll do my, my, I'll answer what I do know, but obviously there are some things that I, I can't answer around this. Um, but I will say that um, a lot of research has shown that um, plastic is um, not necessarily any better for our health um, and is not necessarily any more sanitary, um, especially in the case of uh, grocery bags, so plastic versus reusable bags. Um, and I think that there is obviously a delicate balance between affording our essential workers, especially um, grocery store workers, healthcare workers, and other people on the front lines, the protections they need to feel safe and to help people, um, you know, avoid the pandemic. Um, but that I think that there, there shouldn't be um, a dichotomy between the two. And as we're really rethinking a lot of the systems of our world, there is an opportunity to really pioneer more sustainable ways to do things. Um, and so in a, in a more practical sense, I guess, um, what I mean by that is that um, it is important that we, um, you know, allow certain restrictions um, to protect people's health, um, such as I know that um, a lot of the um, uh, um, grocery stores are not allowing people to bring reusable bags inside um, because of possible contamination. However, there are a lot of ways that we can go around that specific thing. So, um, for example, bringing your bag to the store, leaving it outside or in your car or on your bike or however you got there, and then just bringing your groceries out and bagging them yourselves. So there's a lot of things we can do to still be sustainable and still avoid plastic use while respecting public health. Um, the other aspect of this issue is that Plastic production is in of itself a public health hazard, um, and the production of plastic um, does cause a lot of respiratory problems for the communities in which plastic production plants are located. Um, and so in the long term, um, stopping the production, the sale, and the use of single-use plastics is good for our public health as a nation, um, especially in cases of respiratory-based diseases like COVID-19. Hopefully that answers your question a little bit. I know that got a little long-winded. Thank you um, for answering that. And then we have a question from Chrissy who asks, what do you think we can do to educate people and convince them that the environment is the most pressing issue? Any so I think yeah. maybe I can answer this a little bit. Um, I'm going to start by plugging um, Al Gore's um, leadership group, the Climate Reality um, Group. I just last week did their leadership program, and it's a week-long course that anyone can sign up to be a part of. And I really recommend, if you have the time, they try to make it so that if you have a job, you can also still do the course. Um, but Al Gore does his all of his slides on climate change and its effect around the world now, not even a few years ago, but like during COVID. Um, and I think that what the biggest takeaway I had was that climate change can be linked to something that matters to every single person, their livelihood, how they will um, live. I mean, it, it 
It's going to affect our agriculture and how we farm. It's going to affect um, people and where they live. It's, it, it has so many different interconnections with our daily lives that I think if you can find a way to find what matters to different people and show them how it is affected by the environment or how climate change will affect that then thing that really matters to them, there can potentially um, be a switch in how they think about it. I don't, I hope that answers your question a little bit. Could I add something to that as well? Um, I think too that um, you said, do you guys think that environmental policy and issues will play a big role in the upcoming election? And I think that everyone here are the people who can determine that because we all have the ability to take our questions and our issues and, and things, opinions and other things that we care about and bring that to our legislators. So I really encourage you to um, take all of the reasons that you care about this um, and share them not only with, you know, your friends and your family and your colleagues and all of your Facebook friends, but also to take these concerns and voice them to elected officials. Make a call in to um, whoever is up for election in your local city. Write a letter to your state senator. Um, these are all ways that we can make environmental policy and the specific issues that we care about a bigger role in this election by elevating the um, like public knowledge of them and our policymakers knowledge of them. And I also want to add going off of that that voting is one of the biggest ways that we can have an impact on our earth moving forward and electing people that maybe even if they're not there yet can be persuaded to care about the environment and really push policies. Um, so right now that is really crucial that I think in, in the coming elections, all the elections that we're paying attention and that we're voting for people who are more likely to care about these things. Okay, and then we have just a couple minutes here. Um, so we'll end on a question for Michaela for, for uh, all three panelists. Um, what progress would you like to see happen in ocean conservation in the next 10 years? Well, really what I would like to see is essentially science being put into policy. Taking what we know from scientific research on our oceans and putting it into policy that will ultimately, you know, help with things like plastic pollution and, um, you know, uh, rising ocean temperatures, ocean acidification, things that will try to help mitigate these effects on our oceans and taking what we've learned from science and from research and putting it into policy. Yeah, and I think from there, seeing the policy create spaces or funding that will help bring the science into reality and, you know, help stop coral bleaching. Or um, I, I know in Turks and Caicos right now, they have a lot of coral reef disease and they found ways to um, stop that disease from spreading, but it costs money to, and they need funding. So mm -hmm. I think seeing it become more of a worldwide together issue where we're combating it and really working to reverse the devastation that we've created. Yeah, definitely getting support from um, legislators and people in power, people that are able to implement these types of change is something that's definitely going to be needed in the next 10 years and beyond. Yeah, and personally, I can't help but hope that um, over the next 10 years, we see more people um, start being less afraid of sharks specifically and see them more for the um, animals that they are and their really important um, place in the marine food chain. I would just say the other big one is that I would hope that we would stop burning fossil fuels so that we can just take away that one really big factor of climate change that is threatening every species in our ocean. Definitely. Um, 
great answers, you guys, and we are just at time now. So I want to thank our panelists for answering those questions and for the amazing presentation. And thank you all for joining in tonight. And we will be sure to keep you all in the loop on the ways that you can help keep our oceans clean and help keep our sea animals healthy. All right. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you.